The Haymarket Affair uh, happened on May 1st, 1886. That was the beginning of it. And it centered around workers who took to the streets, hundreds of thousands of workers who took to the streets to demand an eight hour workday. Now, as you can imagine, police didn't respond so well <laughs> to these protesters. Uh, the biggest protest happened in Chicago. So on May 1st, 1886, hundreds of thousands of US workers went on strike and marched, marched to demand the eight hour workday. A day of action called by the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions, the precursor to the American Federation of Labor. But two days later, police shot several striking workers at the city's large McCormick Reaper Works as they scuffled with scabs. Now after that shooting happened, um, you have calls for demonstrations, right? To call out the police brutality, the police violence toward the workers. So the um, soon after that on May 4th, uh, around 2,500 workers gathered at Haymarket Square to listen to speeches. Now the event was peaceful and so the city's mayor told the police, there was about 175 police. He tells the cops, listen, stand down. This is a peaceful gathering, there's no issue here. So don't needlessly uh, you know, cause problems. But they didn't listen and they decided to needlessly cause problems. Mm -hmm. So as the last speaker was wrapping up, the police like go in and they start trying to forcefully disperse the crowd. At some point, someone throws, and at, till this day, we don't know who it is, uh, but someone throws an explosive device into the crowd, and uh, police start shooting indiscriminately. Seven police die, three workers die. Till this day, historians agree that one of the cops died as a result of the explosive device. We don't know for sure how the other police died. In fact, there are some historians who argue that they could have died from other police officers shooting their weapons. So I guess by friendly fire. Anyway, the crazy thing about this is the business community immediately jumps in and they say that the real martyrs here were the police. Mm -hmm. And they start erecting monuments to celebrate the police, okay? But wait till you hear what happens to the monument. It's a pretty incredible story, but so far I'm curious what you guys think. So, John, you've had some reactions already. Oh, you know, it's amazing. I love little details like, you know, curiously, the business community decided to join in. Oh, were they opposed to the workers? Did they use this as an opportunity to point out that they're violent and irrational and you should never associate with them? That is that is weird. Um, but also, like so much of this is deeply fascinating. And by the <coughs> way, while you know we we've done specials before, we've done shows for May Day before. Every year I go back over the history, or whatever. I believe that this is actually the year where I, I like went and found the most because it really is fascinating. Not only what happened then, but the 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 ways that people disagree about it. Um, and the cycles that happen over the next few decades about all the different dueling monuments and where they are and when they're destroyed and it's just fascinating. But all of it is so, it just feels like so many other events too. Like it's easy to hear this happened in 1883 or whatever and you're it like- It sounds oh, like it could happen today. Well, it sounds it sounds like Occupy Wall Street. Mm -hmm. it, sounds, it sounds like a lot, it sounds like the cops trying to break up social justice or like rallies in 2020. Like it sounds like a lot of cases where people finally come together to draw attention to an issue. And then suddenly it's not about that issue anymore. Everyone, everyone, please focus on the fact that they're rowdy and the cops are trying to stand between you and a gas station being burned down. Like, like we're still doing this same exact thing. The media is a little bit more sophisticated and the cops have deadlier weapons, but <laughs> yeah. Um, well, in their propaganda, yeah. In their, I think yeah, that in they their are propaganda, more there, there's no question. But it propaganda. reminds me a lot of recent events too, Absolutely. even though it's 150 years ago. I totally agree with that. I mean, it, it's it's incredible how far back into in this country's history you can find examples of police squashing efforts by workers specifically, mm -hmm. calling attention to the injustices of our system. And that's something that you do, Senator Turner, on a regular basis, both on this show and the campaign trail. So I wanted to open up the conversation to you and, and kind of get your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, it, you could be telling that story in the 21st century. The more things change, the more they stay the same, unfortunately. And even bigger than the police, I mean, at least in this case, as you laid out, the mayor said, hey, things are going peaceably, don't go in. 
and the rogue officers decided to go in anyway, and they caused this. They were the the, the spark for uh, the murders and people being trampled and that kind of thing. But even if we take the police out of it and just think about what workers are enduring right now, that over 60% of workers, <clears throat> you know, can't. You know, cannot afford to do anything but work. That they're one paycheck away from ruin, one health scare away from ruin, and how workers all over this country, at least over the last five years, have really been standing up for their collective bargaining rights. And we have places like Amazon and Starbucks who are just flat out trying to start labor unions. So that same revolutionary, we're gonna fight for our rights, we deserve better than what we're getting. We deserve to be at the collective bargaining table to stand up and fight for better wages, better work conditions, and better mm -hmm. benefits. It is rippling right now in the 21st century. And if anything gives me hope about what we're seeing right now among solidarity and workers, it is the the new rise, and I call it, of workers in the 21st century. And they definitely are tracing the footsteps of workers from our past. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. I mean, you see the incompetence and the corruption of Congress the lack of yes. inaction when it comes to the power the executive branch has to materially improve people's lives. And it's just so depressing and so discouraging. But what always gives me hope is learning from the country's history, right? Learning from how labor organized and essentially made government bend to its will. I mean, you know, we talk about Roosevelt as if he, and Roosevelt was among the best presidents in this country's history when it comes to helping people economically. But I think it's really important to understand, he didn't just do it out of the kindness of his own heart. There was a tremendous amount of pressure coming from organized labor, which led to the New Deal, which led to these policies that improved the lives of, of American workers. Uh, and I think that part of the equation gets left out of the media conversation about these policy decisions because it makes Americans think that all they need to do is cast a ballot mm -hmm. and that's it, that's all that matters. That's the <laughs> political engagement that makes all the difference, except it's not. If you don't have an organized outside pressure campaign like we did in the past with organized labor, well, there's really no way of holding these elected lawmakers accountable mm -hmm. other than sure you can vote them out. But as we've learned with the corruption of the media, that is incredibly hard to do. Yeah. Yeah, I think you rightly point out that you would you might have had something from Roosevelt if everyone just left him alone for four or eight or twelve years or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but you wouldn't got gotten what you got. Same, you know, when it comes to the civil rights movement, even you know, when there was legislative action and the president didn't actively stop it. It's not like that was his lifelong dream and he was just gonna do it. Everybody could have just hung out and it would have been cool. Have we, I'm not a presidential historian, so I address this to the smartest members of our audience as well as Michael Shore. Has there ever been a president who came in raring to fight for something good and just did it? I can think of some ones who, who came in with some really bad motivations. And I can think of some presidents who've come in and done things that were good, if not as good as they could have been. Like, you know, the ACA was certainly better than what came before it. But you wouldn't have just gotten that without pressure, even with the presidents who campaigned the most on changing things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're, we're gonna talk yeah. later on in this hour about individual politicians. And this is just a preview of what I think about the value of individual politicians when it comes to stuff like this. And, and let me just add to that, I mean, even when Asa Philip Randolph, one of the greatest unionists of the 20th century, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, it was a union that he formed. It took a long time, it was a lot of hard work to form that union for black porters on the train. Before that, those black porters just worked purely for tips. So don't get me started on the sub minimum wage and shout out to one fair wage that is fighting to change that. But Asa Philip Randolph did the dance with President FDR and F President FDR said to Asa Philip Randolph, make me do it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people remember the March on Washington in 1960s, but they forget the threat of Asa Philip Randolph and some of his contemporaries to President FDR about marching on Washington. He was primarily focused on the treatment of African Americans when it came to federal jobs and because FDR did not want to be embarrassed, we can't forget it was the backdrop of World War II. 
Asa Philip Randolph was able to get some concessions, not all that he wanted, but some concessions from the president. So both the points that you are making, Anna and John is right. The outside forces are usually what pushes any elected leader to do the right thing. Even though they may come in there raring to go, there are other forces competing for their attention, their time as well. And so if good never speaks up and fights, evil, evil never takes a vacation. So I said good can never rest because evil never takes a vacation. But just one quick quote from Asa Philip Randolph that I think is very apropos for this show, for this moment that we find ourselves in as working class people. He once said a community is democratic only when the highest civil, economic and social rights that the biggest and most powerful possessed are are afforded to the least of these. You know, Absolutely. and I'm paraphrasing, but that's Asa Philip Randolph. And that's where we find ourselves in the 20th. 21st century. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, I really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.